What's the word, y'all? It is time to talk Cleveland Cavaliers. A very interesting season for them while the rest of the league was getting smaller and smaller. They decided to run three seven-footers, and it worked. They have this new big three of Darius Garland, Jared Allen, and Evan Mobley. And though the season didn't end the way they wanted to, they're trying to get better for the next. Of course, this is my series where I bring on some diehard fans to talk about their favorite team. So let's get into it with the Chase Down Pod. And now I am joined by the co-hosts of the chase down pod justin carter welcome onto the show thank you guys for being here thank you so much for having us i'm excited it should yeah. be fun man yeah it, it's it's dog days the off season already uh, um and we needed something to entertain ourselves with so this this <laughs> is better than anything else so i talked about this in the previous episode when i was talking about the grizzlies where i wish that the nba did some form of spotify wrapped with their league pass right yeah. So it shows you you watch this many games or this many minutes or this many, this many hours. The reason I'm bringing that up is because the Cavaliers 100% would have been number one on my league pass list. I, I'm 100% certain of it. It would have been them, Memphis, and then maybe Lakers third just because it's the Lakers. Um, but I've watched a ton of Cavaliers basketball this season because we're like kind of connected in a way after the Laurie Market and sign and trade. So I wanted Naturally. to see what he was up to. And <laughs> overall, I know it didn't finish the way people anticipated, but I would say as an outsider, a successful season, right? Absolutely. And the fun thing about watching the Cavs all season and following along on league passes, you got to watch like four different versions of the team. Like yeah. you had the, the fun ball movement with multiple ball handlers. Then all of a sudden it became like the Darius Garland show in, in January where things were still clicking post Ricky Rubio and then everything fell apart. And then it, yeah. it wasn't as much fun in that chapter, but uh, I, I still think they, they wildly uh, exceeded my expectations and you know what you you look at some of the the best team building situations like the warriors and all that on the way up you had some bad injury luck that that gave you maybe that extra little chip that'll give you over the get you over the top and i mean it summer league is wrapped up it's silly season you just buy into all the hype and ochai abaji is clearly our desmond bain now <laughs> naturally it all makes sense uh no it was a really fun year uh you know i i said to our listeners all year like you better be having fun right now because this is the most fun season as a fan. Like other than like the moment you win the title, like the no pressure, uh, all surprise fun season is like the best as a fan. Mm -hmm. every, every Cavalanche was a party, by the way. Thank you so much for wearing that uh, greeting from Sexland shirt. Oh, we, yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got to respect the brand. Um, it was just, I thought it was a great foundational season. You know, like uh, all Justin and I had been begging for the last couple of years was, all we we didn't need you know to be a, a title contender again right away but we just wanted the team to be more than the sum of its parts like and they finally were that you know they finally you saw like pieces kicking clicking together and really doing something special on, on, on some nights and and that was just really really gratifying to see so you mentioned the sex land sure had to represent um there's a world where this is like th this is over right <laughs> sex land is no longer what well, uh you guys are probably more in the loop than i am about what colin sexton and his camp and the cavaliers are thinking about but what's the likelihood that um this shirt will be more of a throwback i hope it's not i i mean i i've got the sex land poster right behind me i'm 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 not i'm not ready to get off of that train just yet but i mean it's such a unique situation because right now the Cavs have 15 NBA contract spoken mm -hmm. for like they need to clear a roster spot and I, I think all the reporting seems to suggest they want to avoid the luxury tax I think right now they're about 15 million below that um, so maybe all of a sudden you get a little more flexibility if you move off of one of those contracts and you can offer a deal um, I just think like looking at the market it seems like there, there's not a lot of homes like a lot of teams the only teams with cap space are Indy and the Spurs and I, I Indy's loaded with guards and the Spurs aren't trying to win. So I mm -hmm. don't think that's going to happen. Although, as you alluded to before with the Lowry situation, you never know who's interested, right? Like there were no Cavs rumors about marketing. Uh, and then four weeks into free agency, all of a sudden that sign and trade happened. So I wouldn't rule it out, but uh, I'm, I'm still optimistic that Sexton will be back with the Cavs. Yeah, the thing is, I mean, what I think even a lot of Cavs fans are forgetting is that the Cavs have a qualifying offer out to the guy. I mean, like it's <laughs> barring a sign and trade, it's literally guaranteed he is back next year. Right. I mean, unless they decide to withdraw the QO, which they're not going to do. So I think at, at, at the minimum, uh, we should expect to see them together. But, you know, I, I think it's probably a pretty major dent. I mean, if you're Colin, 
and you didn't get a long-term deal and you had to play on a QO, like you're probably not feeling super endeared uh, at that point. And may, and, but you know, you can't rule anything out, but like, I, I do think we'll at least get to see the proof of concept early on in the season. Cause I do think he's going to be here, whether it's on a qualifying offer or if they can please figure something out. But <laughs> Justin and I are both on team figure something out. We both are big Colin fans. So I was watching that game. Like I mentioned, a ton of league pass uh, Cavaliers and it was against the Knicks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And there wasn't a moment with the injury, right? There was no him on the ground holding his knee. I think he went into halftime and just didn't come back out. And and on the broadcast, um, they were like, hope he's okay. And he never came back. Yeah. And it was such a sad story. But I think the silver lining was like Ricky Rubio almost hit 40 that game, right? And then, <laughs> you know, he was so very important. It was at the point where I was memeing, of course, but like I had a – NBA All-Star Ballot, Ricky Rubio. Ricky Rubio's at the top of the list. And now the offseason has come, and he's back. So so talk to me about the offseason for the Cleveland Cavaliers from your perspective. I'm excited about it. Like, I, I'm not counting on Ricky to be a big contributor. Like, honestly, I think Howell Neto is a better backup point guard than they had for the majority of last season because Ricky only was here for about 30 games, and then he got hurt. Uh, I, I think it's an improvement from Brandon Goodwin and Rajon Rondo and, and some of the other options that they had to explore last year. So I think Ricky signing a three-year deal is kind of there to help these guys along, like help be that coach and that mentor. And then hopefully, whether it's later on this year or next season, he's able to come back and, you know, contribute in whatever way he's available to do. Uh, but it really feels like bringing in those veterans, bringing in those backup point guards, bringing in Robin Lopez. Um, it's all about kind of like supporting the young core that they have and, and seeing what those pieces can do when they're not being asked to do too much. And personally, like if we're starting the year and it's Colin Sexton and Karis Levert as kind of the, the backup ball handlers, I think you can actually get a pretty good second unit offense with those guys, whether it's uh, both of them coming off the bench or staggering, whatever the case may be. I, I think that can actually work out, especially if you're relying on maybe Mobley or Love to provide some front court playmaking. Yeah, I, I think like when you look at this offseason, they certainly didn't trade three first round picks for DeJounte Murray. You know, there's <laughs> there's there's one way to go and then there's the way the Cavs went. And like, you know, Justin, I think, said something uh, really made a smart comment, which I I, neg I hesitate to ever. I, I, I rarely him. do it, but I appreciate <laughs> um, you bringing it up. But you said that next year is probably the win now year where you start making some win now moves. This year is the win with what you have now yeah. year. You know, and like, I thought that was a really good way. Like, they're going to try to win as many games as they can. This is not like a tanking team mm -hmm. or like, let's just develop the young guys. Like, they're going to play the guys who help them win the most, I, I I think at least. But like, you look at, you know, Robin Lopez, Howell Neto, Ricky Rubio, even their draft pick, Ochai Baji. Like, these are all floor raiser picks, not ceiling raiser picks, you know. And I think what they're betting on is that. They've got plenty of ceiling raisers at the top of their roster already, and Darius, mm -hmm. Evan, and Jarrett, and they just they just are looking for sixteen game players, dudes. Because I they got into the plan, and you could kind of see JB looking around, going, "I don't really know who I'm supposed to trust yeah. here <laughs> around yeah. around my big three. And of course, Jarrett only played in one of them. I think they're I think they are on the hunt for sixteen game players, and I think that's kind of what they look to add this off season. So you guys mentioned Abaji's name a few times. Uh, candidly, I don't watch any college basketball, so like my introduction. We don't either. Okay, right, great. Right we're all you, we're pal. all together. My introdu my introduction to a lot of these players are summer league, and pretty pretty successful summer league for me. But I want to go back because I I read articles after drafts to try to figure out who won and who lost, and obviously nothing is ever really true until the careers are over. But from the ringer, Kevin O'Connor, he gave the pick a C plus, which is the worst at the entire first round. But on the other hand, CBS Sports gave it an A+. Plus. So <laughs> I have no frame of reference on whether or not this is a good pick, an average pick, or anything like that. But I was there Summer League the first couple days, and we got to watch, and I was like, I underst understand the pick. You mm -hmm. know, I, know, I think he was one of the older people drafted. Um, but as you guys mentioned, floor raisers and things like that, I, I can see it. I can see exactly what they were going for. 
Yeah, like it, he's 22 years old and I, I always push back on the whole concept of like finished product because even if you look at like the most improved winners over like the last decade, half of them came into the league at 22 years old, right? Like when these guys are getting with pro trainers for the first time in their career, there are obviously room for growth, right? And, and I mean, some of the, even the runner up, like Desmond Bain was in the mix for most improved. Buddy Heald was 24 when he was a rookie. Uh, like I, I think when you're talking about a 22 year old, you're not all of this you're not expecting him to like add something out of the blue like i'm not expecting him to all of a sudden have handles like Kyrie or anything like that but i can see him improving along the margins and improving what he does well currently and elevating that at the nba level and i think you look at summer league and he was like there were no easy shots there like he mm -hmm. he was coming off of screens he uh mo motion floppy uh, elevator doors like they, they can run all sorts of different types of plays for him and he can get his shot off and when you look at last season there was never there's no one on the Cavs that L could Lowry do that kind Markinen of stuff off was the best yeah. volume three-point shooter for them Jetty Osmond was hugely important for them mid-year because he's a dude who's willing to fire off movement from three. They just don't have a lot of those guys. Even when Colin was healthy, Colin really likes to kind of take a, take a second, get set there. They didn't have these quick trigger three point artists on the team. Yeah. And like, you know, with Ibaji, like, I think we were both like, okay, solid pick. Like mm -hmm. we weren't like over the moon. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I, I kind of wanted to preach a little patience with, with Cavs fans is, you know, with these high floor players, there's a lot of like this impulse to assume that they're definitely going to be good at all the stuff they were good at in college right away. And like, I think JJ Reddick shot like 33% from three is rookie year. Like that yeah. NBA line is no joke. Yeah. Like it, <laughs> it, there's a difference. Uh, and so like, you know, and with a high floor player, maybe a lower ceiling player, like Igbaji, if he didn't have the jumper, I was I'm like, Oh God, <laughs> but dude can shoot. Yeah, you can shoot, and he can and, play defense. They they didn't have someone that could do both. Yes, right. and that's a huge, <laughs> it, huge addition. It, it's such it's such a picture perfect fit for them, and I just don't see how this guy doesn't get minutes on, yeah. on this team, even even with the 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 crowded group at the two and the, and to some extent the three. Though obviously the you know big threes is a weakness of the team uh, <laughs> to be uh, clear, but like. <laughs> You know, I do think Ibaji clearly can fit the role and he looks and that's why you got to, you know, give shout out to the Cavs scouting team because they're like, OK, no, we this dude can shoot. He can play this role for us. And it looks like they nailed it as far as I'm concerned so far. So we've gone uh, a little while without mentioning the name Evan Mobley. Mm -hmm. Story, I, I got fl flown out, flown out. I flew out to California pre-draft. Um, for a shoot where they had me interview a bunch of uh, players that were in the draft. And then after the shoot, there was like this very light uh, run where these up and coming players that were to be drafted in a few weeks were just going to play around and, and play some hoops. And it was my first time ever watching Evan Mobley play basketball. And in that moment, I said, this guy's a star. And he was go they were going at 70 percent, maybe. But the way he was moving was something I haven't really seen, and I was extremely excited. So when he ended up at number three, I was like, oh, this should be interesting. Jared Allen is there. Does he project Thank to be you, more Houston. of a four than a five, right? <laughs> a four to, to five. And it, it turned out it didn't matter because they decided to do something that we haven't seen in a very long time and run this three seven-foot footer lineup. And I remember I have my bad takes like everybody else does. Um, we were talking about that offseason on my podcast, and I was like, there's no way in hell that Laurie Market and Evan Mobley and Jared Allen works. And then we get to the regular season, and it worked. And I think a lot of that is due to Jared Allen and Evan Mobley just being so versatile um, on the defensive side of the ball. So I that that is the reason. I, th I think it started off immediately that I wanted to see the three uh, big man lineup. That's why I started watching the Cavs. And when I saw it working, I was like, okay, I got to tune in every single day. So, yeah. so t talk to me about Mobley, man. Mobley is just the guy. Man, we, we were skeptical about the, the three big lineup too. And I, I think the Cavs just prioritize skill sets like more than what position you are. And Lowry was their best path to getting spacing on the court. But I, I remember Carter and I both were in Cleveland for opening weekend where the Cavs played the Hornets and the Hawks. And we saw Evan Mobley comfortably switch on to LaMelo Ball and Trey Young and lock them up. Mm -hmm. And we were preaching 
patience with them. We're like, okay, this guy's, he's going to do a lot of like kind of nuanced stuff and just really understands the game, but it's not going to be anything flashy. And he completely exceeded our expectations. And honestly, like, I, I, I still think it's like a bit of a blind spot for us at times because he's so quiet and unassuming. Like we don't get like super, super hyped. Yeah. Uh, about him uh, or at least as much as we should but this i feel guy... like i have to talk like wider nba twitter down sometimes which like how <laughs> often is like a super fan are you like guys chill a little bit yeah. <laughs> but he's just like a ridiculously special talent and you look at kind of the the progression throughout the season like Obviously, the tandem of him and Allen working so well is a big part of why the Cavs were good. Like, you look at the Cavs with Mobley and no Allen. The defensive drop-off is identical mm -hmm. to the drop-off of Allen with no Mobley. Like, the, the two of them work so well together. And I think when you're talking about reasons for optimism with the Cavs, it's that Garland, Mobley, and Allen only played 40 games together last season. And they already fit so well. So as Mobley continues to, like, add an outside shot and add things to his game that those three are only going to fit better like the the fact that they work so well they won so many games uh the stats were good the eye test was good like that is just so so encouraging to have that as your foundation moving forward to to me you know there's been all these comps thrown out you know you get a lot of kg because of the body and the frame you get some bosh because of the way he can kind of handle and hit that mid-range jumper and hit that turnaround uh in the post to me, like the only comp I ever really use with him is Duncan. And I think oh, it's I because, it. and I think it's because of the way he feels the game. Slim like, Duncan, baby. <laughs> Slim Duncan. Uh, I love that he can really, really impact the game while putting up 19 and 11, you know, like, the, and, and like, you can really, really feel him. And like, I do think there's some people who think his game's going to evolve to become like this AD style volume scorer. And I don't actually see that. And I don't actually care. Like, I think this dude can be a top five player in the NBA averaging 23 points a game. Like, mm -hmm. his, his feel, and not necessarily just in the counting stats, but, like, just the way he kind of occupies the geometry of the floor on both ends. Like, I just think he has whatever it is uh, on both sides. And, like, it's just the sky is the limit for him. Like, there's so many things that he can get better at still, and he is so impactful. Like, he, like... I mean, the best compliment you can ever say is that for a rookie is that they are good as an NBA player, not right. as a rookie. And I thought he was a great NBA player right away. And like, I just, I, I don't even know what to make of the guy. <laughs> so I, I was listening to um, Zach Lowe's podcast and somehow they got to talking about the Cavaliers. And I think it was through the Lakers. But anyway, I'm going to ask this question. You usually is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm going to ask this question uh, because you guys are Cleveland guys. Le LeBron is going to be um, a free agent relatively soon via Zach Lowe's podcast. The Cavs will have cap space around that time. How welcome do you think LeBron would be to come back considering the success with the younger guys? Did that change up anything? I, I, I think... I think he'd be welcome. Like, I, I think people would embrace it. I'm skeptical. I like, I, I think he's probably going to stay with the Lakers and, and maybe like at the end of the career, you kind of get like the, the like farewell tour kind yeah. of thing. Um, but I, I think he's probably going to stick it out with the Lakers, but obviously like we, we Carter already mentioned it. One of the biggest gaps is a big wing, right? And, and he would be about a perfect the best fit. one ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and and as long as like if he came back, you wouldn't want all of a sudden Garland's traded for Chris Paul, Allen's traded for DeAndre right. Jordan, or whatever the case may be. Like you wouldn't want that sort of thing because now we're invested in this, right? Like it's it's something that's organic and, and it's a much better foundation than even the one he returned to uh, in, in his first return. So I, I think people would be open to it. I'm I'm just skeptical. I, I'm just skeptical that it would happen next year. Like I, I can see him uh, signing like a one year deal and kind of feeling out the market to see where Bronny ends up and that right. sort of thing. But um, like, I, I don't know how much the cap space like even factors into it. Cause at the end of the day, like sign and trades are back in vogue. Right. And, and I, I think if they were looking to add him or if they were looking to do that sort of a deal, I, I would assume it'd be a sign and trade more than like preserving cap space for that. Cause mm -hmm. there's other wings on the market too. And, and uh, pieces that could really help the Cavs moving forward beyond LeBron James. Yeah, Justin's uh Justin is, you know, just a hating ass hater. I bring bring him home. Bring him home. It'd be a lot of fun. I think, you know, the the things that are appealing to me about a LeBron return is that 
So obviously the first time it was, you know, kind of all LeBron all the time. Clearly the supporting cast wasn't there. And then the, even the second time, even though the Kyrie piece was there and the love trade was clearly kind of preordained, like he was coming to save us. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm sentimental. It's kind of fun to be like, why don't you come home? We got you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why do you? That was a nice little He's venture. He's been trying in LA. to have someone to give the torch to. That, that's yeah. what Anthony Davis was supposed to be, and so far hasn't been that. And, Ky- and kind of Kyrie, and though. Kyrie you know, too, I think yeah. I think to some extent he can he can own some of that with uh, <laughs> with some of the reporting out there. But yeah, I don't know. I I'll tell you what. Uh, when we were in Cleveland for All Star, Justin and I had our ears perked up, like when for the starting lineup announcement. We're like, wonder what the reception is going to be mm-hmm. like. Like, is there is it going to be a little more mixed? Is that going to like what's the erupted yeah huge huge reaction so like i think like there will always be even the people who are grumps about it i think once you see the guy once you start re-watching the basketball brilliance it's like of course you want him back at least that's me and the drama i don't know like i i have i'm at the point where you know maybe i'm getting older the drama i just think is funny (laughs) <laughs> and like, I don't, I don't get worked up about it anymore. And there's always going to be a circus that comes with LeBron, but yeah, I, I think it would be fun to have him back. And like the idea of, I mean, plus, I mean, just, I love basketball and a, and a core of Darius Garland, LeBron James, Evan Mobley, and Jared Allen. Like you as have fun to look, as can be, yeah. that's about <laughs> as fun as basketball can get. So yeah. I think that I, but I, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. That's for sure. It's, Low, low leaning into it so hard on that last podcast was like yeah oh like right i don't know that caught me off guard that he was so willing to go so far out there like that i did not expect that from a careful guy like zach Lowe. <laughs> yeah it makes no sense for me to enjoy the Cavs as much as i do considering we're supposed to be division rivals even though i guess divisions doesn't they don't matter division, in basketball so matter. <laughs> um but i see you with the j ram shirt that's definitely a point where we we're clashing heads right now um <laughs> but I, I appreciate you guys coming on to the show um anything other than the podcast you'd like to to plug i'll put everything in the description no, uh, it's basically just the podcast. I, I don't know, Carter, if you want to uh, plug all your esports stuff or whatever the case. Oh, you <laughs> big esports guy. <laughs> yeah, oh that's, yeah, that's I, I, that's what my day job is. I'm a I oh, work wow. in esports production, but no, we, uh, we don't write anymore. We're lazy podcasters yeah. now. So if <laughs> yeah. you just, if you come find us on YouTube on the Cavs official channel, or find us on any of your favorite podcast platforms, that's where you can come listen to us. Cool. I appreciate you guys stopping by. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having us.